Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Healy. I run the cyber programs at Columbia University School of International Public Affairs, and I've just been so excited for this event um, with some fabulous colleagues uh, to talk about um, uh, these issues. So this is arranged as part of the Nijilo Roden Digital Futures Forum. It's been organized with the support of the Saltzman Institute and War and Peace Studies. My thanks to Veer Pratam Bikram Singh for, for helping put this together. Um, I'm not going to keep any time because I want to hear what the panelists have to say. So we're going to turn right uh, to Matt Gertzen. He's a, a researcher I just published a great report um, with uh, Data and Society. And let's turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Jason. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to moderate this event. Uh, I have had the great privilege to watch uh, both of the reports that we're going to be discussing today kind of in their development phase over the past couple of years. Um, and uh, it's just, it's such a great uh, thrill to see them out in the world. And, uh, and as a backdrop for this discussion on the subject of bug bounty programs and their uh, history and their contemporary application today. Um, so we're gonna have a, a pretty standard format where I'm gonna give a, a little bit of context for the event. And then uh, our panelists will each present a little bit about the, the papers that they've, that they've just published. Um, I think that'll probably take us about uh, 30, 40 minutes, something like that. And then we'll move into a, you know, semi-structured uh, conversation where I'll ask some, ask uh, questions. I'll also keep a track on the, the Q&A section for any questions from the audience and intersperse those as appropriate. And uh, we'll also allow the panelists to, you know, jump in and address questions that uh, come in from the audience uh, if, they, if they see anything that particularly grabs their interest. Um, so that's about it, I think. Um, so I will, I'll, briefly introduce uh, each of the people here. So first we have Ryan Ellis, who is an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Northeastern University and an affiliate of uh, Data and Society Research Institute. Ryan's research and teaching focuses on topics related to communication law and policy, infrastructure politics, and cybersecurity. He's the author of Letters, Power Lines, and Other Dangerous Things, The Politics of Infrastructure Security, and the editor with Vivek Mohan of Rewired Cybersecurity Governance. And then we have Yuan Stevens, who is a legal and policy expert focused on information security, data protections, and human rights. She works towards a world where powerful actors and the systems they build are held accountable to the public, especially when it comes to vulnerable and marginalized people. She brings years of international experience to her work as a researcher, having examined the impacts of technology on vulnerable populations in Canada, the US, and Germany. Yuan is a research affiliate of Data and Society Research Institute and a collaborator at the Center for Media, Technology and Democracy at McGill University. She previously worked at Harvard University's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society during her studies and joint degree in civil and common law at McGill University. Camille Francois is a lecturer at the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs and the co-lead of the Algorithmic Justice League's Community Reporting of Algorithmic Systems Harms Crash Project. Her work spans several aspects of cybersecurity, from developing industry-leading programs focused on protecting vulnerable users to detecting information operations. Currently the Global Director for Trust and Safety at Niantech, she was previously Chief Innovation Officer at Graphica, where she built and led a team dedicated to exposing and mitigating information operations across platforms, and prior to that, a Principal Researcher at Google. Camille has advised governments and parliamentary committees on both sides of the Atlantic and investigated Russian interference in the 2016 US presidential election on behalf of the US Senate Select Intelligence Committee. And finally, we have Josh Kenway, who's a policy analyst at PayPal working on corporate governance for technology and cybersecurity. And until mid 2021, he was a research fellow with the Algorithmic Justice League, where he was part of the community reporting, uh, again, the crash project I just described. Prior to joining PayPal, Josh was an associate of the Cyber Threat Alliance, a nonprofit organization that enables the sharing of information on cyber threats among cybersecurity companies, governments, and civil society organizations. So we have a very impressive cast of characters here with a vast breadth of knowledge, and I'm very excited for this. Um, so I think we can move over to the next slide really quickly, um, if that's all right. And I am the co-author alongside uh, my frequent collaborator and former 
advisor, Gabriella Coleman of the, the recent Data and Society report, Wearing Many Hats. And that report kind of looks at the uh, early history of hackers professionalizing throughout the 1990s. And it really forms a perfect kind of precursor, prehistory to a lot of the topics we're gonna to discuss today. Uh, so I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the material we cover in that report, which was also uh, released, I think, about three weeks ago by Data Society. Um, and basically, in, in, in our report, we look at um, the emergence of two very important phenomena by which hackers, um, you know, people who break into uh, secure com com computer systems, um, sought to kind of change the, the pub public conversation and the process by which security issues were thought about and addressed. Um, so one of the issues we really take on seriously in that report is the uh, practice of what, what was called full disclosure, and it still exists in some form today. And full disclosure basically involved hackers finding vulnerabilities in security systems and publishing them publicly to the world, making them known, and in doing so, you know, putting pressure on vendors like Microsoft was one of their big targets and also, you know, institutions of all sorts to take those issues very seriously, uh, address them, patch them, do whatever they could to uh, ensure that other hackers, perhaps of more malicious intent, could not exploit them to harm. And um, this practice was, you know, very common among a variety of mailing lists. Uh, one of the ones we talk about in the report most um, intensively is called bug track. Um, and, you know, over time, um, people working for companies would come to these lists, engage with these people, take the issues seriously. Before that, often uh, vendors would pretend that those issues didn't exist because there was really no way to hold them ac accountable. Um, Another phenomenon we look at is something we call security by spectacle, which is the way that hackers sometimes staged, um, you know, spectacular media focused um, actions like releasing tools that made exploitation of vulnerabilities even, even more easy uh, in order to kind of exacerbate the threat, exacerbate the potential for harm and thus motivate vendors to move more seriously um, or more quickly. Now, by the end of the 1990s, many of the hackers that participated in these practices actually became employees of a lot of the, the companies that they had formerly antagonized. Uh, Microsoft in particular went on a hiring spree, um, hiring many, many prominent hackers and also um, you know, consulting with a, a security firm called At Stake, which also uh, you know, hired many of the hackers that had been involved in full disclosure research. And so there's kind of a, uh, you know, from the early 1990s to the, to the early 2000s, there was kind of a water, a sea change where hackers suddenly were often working for the very companies that they had been um, uh, exposing vulnerabilities in. Now, this is important context because bug bounty programs, the topic of which we're going to discuss today, was the major kind of counter trend uh, in a lot of that kind of profession, like hiring of standing professional security researchers. And bug bounties basically created a casualized market uh, by which uh, companies could uh, solicit the submission of vulnerabilities in a very private directed way and pay piecemeal uh, to the workers who did that. And we're gonna hear a lot more about the dynamics of that in just a second as I turn it over to, I believe, uh, Ryan Ellis. Uh, Ryan is, uh, is, the, is starting. Um, so yeah, take it away. And um, I'm excited for this. Thanks, everyone. All right, great. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Welcome from my basement in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm sorry we can't be together, but I'm glad we can connect this way. So I thought what um, I would do with you, Anne, my co-author on this new report, Bounty Everything, Hackers and the Making of the Global Bug Marketplace, which we published with Data and Society a couple of weeks ago, was provide you with like the Cliff Notes overview of the report. It's a long report. These are all very detailed, excellent long reports, but I thought it'd be useful to have like a quick summary. So you, Anne, and I are going to spend a little time just walking through maybe 10 minutes what the report argues, sort of top line conclusions. So a little bit of context here. Um, for our report, we were really curious about bug bounty programs. 
but we want to understand them, where they came from, where they're going, and most importantly, what they mean for the workers who participate in them. So we went out and we interviewed about over 40 different folks who participate in the market. That's hackers who find and sell flaws, people who do triage and run and manage these programs as well. I think a couple of the folks we spoke with might be listening today, and I can't wait for them to chime in and tell us what we got wrong uh, at the end during Q&A. Um, but those stories really informed our report. And what we found was that bounty programs offer a lot of fantastic opportunities. There's pleasure to be found in the market. There's new career opportunities. They stabilize. They provide opportunities for recognition for hackers that have been missing. They provide rewards to hackers as well. However, some of the more celebratory accounts of the market seem to miss what the labor dynamics actually are and the ways in which bug bounty programs in some ways have created unanticipated risks. Risks both for the workers themselves who are participating in this market and in some ways, broader security risks for all of us. When they're not designed correctly or implemented appropriately, bug bounty programs can actually be counterproductive and can undermine security. So by going out and speaking with these people, we got a little bit better insight into how the market operates, what makes it tick, and we're gonna share all that with you today. Um, so the report does and sort of walks through a couple of key topics. First, we provide a sort of overview of what bug bounty programs are, and I'll do that in just a moment. Then we talk about where they came from, their history starting in the mid-1990s with Netscape. Then we look at the motivations for people who participate in this market and the risks that they face. And then finally, we conclude with some recommendations about how we can maybe imagine a future where bug bounty programs serve not only um, the interests of the programs that run them, but workers and society at large. So very quickly, um, I'm going to give a quick overview of what bug bounty programs are in case any of you are unfamiliar this is new to you. So bug bounty programs are fairly simple and straightforward. There are ways in which hackers sell bugs to programs and platforms. They can be operate in a few different ways. They can be open or closed. Open, anyone can submit. Closed, so only invitation only. Additionally, they can be run by the vendor themselves. So Microsoft or Google or Facebook might run their own bug bounty program. Or they can be run by a platform like HackerOne or BugCrowd that runs them for them. Now, these programs were once upon a time like really novel and the province of high tech companies. Now, it seems like everybody has one. United Airlines, Department of Defense, we always are updating the slides. My favorite recent one is Lululemon, the clothing, uh, the clothing company. Um, so they become pretty common. But for the folks that are working in them, as we'll see, um, they can have unanticipated risks and hazards. So briefly, I'll walk through the history if we go to the next slide and tell you where they came from, how they started out. So bug bounty programs sort of emerge from two competing different interests. On the one hand, there's something of a PR stunt, a way of sweeping under the rug bad press. So to understand that sort of thrust and where they come from, we have to go back to what seems like yesterday to me and maybe some of the other folks on the call, but from some other people it might be ancient history, to the mid-1990s and Netscape. So Netscape was at the time in 1995, one of the largest and most stunning successes on Wall Street. They had just gone public and their browser, Netscape Navigator, you see the little logo there on the left-hand side, that sort of aqua N, um, dominated the market. It was the first most successful widely used um, web browser. Netscape had gone public in a stunning display and had sort of dominated um, Wall Street expectations and was a real star. However, they had two serious problems at the time. The first problem was they didn't really make any money, which is always a problem. The second problem, which was equally annoying to the folks who ran Netscape was that every time a security researcher or a hacker found a new flaw in Netscape's software, it seemed to make headline news. And we're not just talking like in the computer security press, we're talking the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, NPR. Repeatedly, security researchers were finding bugs, disclosing them to the public through what Matt described as full disclosure and making headline news. This was a serious problem, a serious headache for Netscape. And in the fall of 1995, they decided to do something about it. They decided to launch what they described at the time as a bugs bounty program. It was a way in which hackers would not be sued, their voices wouldn't be restrained in that way, they'd be invited to submit their bugs to Netscape privately. And Netscape would pay them t-shirts, a couple hundred bucks in exchange for submitting their bug to them directly. It was a brilliant idea. It was a way of short circuiting and cutting off the sort of headaches, bad press that was associated with full disclosure while borrowing some of the ethos of the free and open source software movement of collaboration, inviting hackers in. Netscape's sort of gambit was pretty successful. The press attention quickly changed and for a while, this no longer was a big problem for Netscape. So one of the things that this story tried to bring out, and the reason why I think the history is interesting, not just like as a historical curiosity, 
is it shows us that power and control in some ways were baked into the model of bugs from day one. It was a way of restraining and counteracting full disclosure. If we go to the next slide, that'd be helpful. But bug, bug bounty programs didn't just emerge from the desire of companies to sort of enclose disclosure and sort of cut off the sort of free flow of information that hackers were celebrating at the time. It had a different genesis as well. In the early 2000s, hackers were starting to demand more respect, more recognition, more legal protections, and money. So here we have a great sign scrawled on a piece of cardboard, no more free bugs. And that's Dino uh, Dazavi and Alex Sadarov. Charlie Miller is sort of the third of the three musketeers. And they got up on stage in 2009 at a big conference at CanSec West, a security conference, and said that no more would they be submitting bugs free of charge. They wouldn't release them to the public. They weren't going to release them to vendors unless they got paid. This was an important moment. Hackers were standing up and articulating a new desire and a new sort of conception of their work as work. From now on, they said, you're not gonna get this from free, you gotta pay us. Companies like Google and then Facebook and Microsoft were listening and they basically agreed. They instituted bug bounty programs as a way to recognize the work hackers were doing, the serious and important contribu contributions they were making, providing them also with some legal protections and a pathway to gain some recognition. And it was very important and useful. What happened next was bug bounty programs didn't just stay in that little corner of the world, of the high tech world. They started to spread out significantly. And the way they did so was by being adopted by bug bounty companies, platforms like HackerOne and BugCrowd. They would take this model and spread it seemingly everywhere. So you can chart it from Netscape to Microsoft and Google to the Lululemons of the world. And when that happened, bug bounty programs no longer were just a way for covering up bad PR. They were no longer a way to just simply provide recognition for security researchers. They became a way of transforming hacking into gig work. And that transformation is very important. So I think we'll go on to the next slide and I'll turn it over to my co-author, Yuan. Yuan, I think this is where you jump in. Yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for having me. Super um, glad to be here and talk about our research on bug bounties. So I wanted to talk about who bug bounty workers are and what motivates them. Um, we found in our work that bug bounty work draws on a young and global workforce uh, of people working hard to find security flaws in systems. So when bug bounty programs became predominant, and particularly in 2010 and beyond, um, uh, it, it attracted a global workforce. Reports from bug bounty programs um, and platforms HackerOne and BugCrowd provide a window into this labor market. We found from looking at their reports from 2019, 2020, um, that a large majority of workers are under 30 and under 20, and many are students. HackerOne's report from 2020 shows as well that 40% of hackers spend 20 plus hours a week hacking to find bugs, which is a lot of time. And despite bug bounty platforms advertising about high worker wages, research by Ryan and others shows that only a small handful of hackers earn the bulk of these bounty payouts. And his work, Ryan, um, is in, uh, in this book, New Solutions for Cybersecurity. And feel free to add to anything I missed on that, Ryan, because I know you did such important research on that. No, I think you got it, Ryan. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, so what that means though is that, is that there's stratification. There is uh, you know, a lot of money to earn, but a small amount of people are earning a lot of money and the majority of people are earning small amounts of money. So the promises of bug bounty, uh, uh, bug bounty work as really lucrative don't come true necessarily for a lot of the people. So as mentioned, the bug bounty workforce is international and HackerOne and BugCrowd reports um, say that upwards of 70, 80% of people disclosing flaws to their platforms are based outside of the US. Um, these platforms have also reported that 10 to 20% of their registered hackers are based in India, who make up a significant portion of this workforce. And the, the last thing we found too is that most of the companies with bug bounty programs are in the US, showing that these companies are relying on a young workforce outside of the country with many people coming from the global south. So to go to the next slide, I wanted to talk about what motivates bug bounty workers. Um, we have a text heavy slide here showing uh, uh, what motivates people, but I, I, you know, I'm just pulling some highlights from a report. And the first thing I wanted to say is that there is no single motivation for hacking or engaging in bug bounty work. Motivations often overlap and work by Gabriela Coleman shows that hackers constitute a, a constellation of loosely tethered and evolving subcultures with shifting members, Morris and rights. But what we found is that many people who do bug bounty work do it full-time, some people do it part-time, and many do it on the side for extra spending money. And it's important to acknowledge as well that several hackers we spoke to appreciated the flexibility of bug bounty work in terms of working hours and choosing what to hack on, and many of you engaging in bug bounties as an on-ramp to more secure work. 
And there's even this entire industry of training people to do bug bounty work. You can get certificates, you can, you can go to um, sort of informal schools and, and, and do training for this, which means that there's another even, there's another you know, market emerging on top of the market for flaws. In terms of the actual motivations as well beyond money and, 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 and um, remuneration, many hackers we spoke to said they found hacking fun and saw their efforts similar to solving a puzzle. For them, they think that um, bug bounty work is a type of technical work where they can improve their skills and get better at what they do. Amat Kama is one hacker we spoke to who said, it's the intellectual satisfaction about, you know, just finding a bug and exploiting a program and making it do something it wasn't intended to do. The puzzle solving aspect of it, I think, is pretty satisfying. Other hackers we spoke to find security work and hacking and bug bunny work you know, thrilling or engaging. There can be a rush with finding something that is serious and that can be exploited. One hacker we spoke to described the ability to send negative amounts of money on a cryptocurrency platform and therefore receiving positive amounts as something that came with a rush because he realized that this thing he had found could be exploited for, for serious harm potentially. Many others that we spoke to as well found the work satisfying from a moral standpoint. They, they think of what they do as, as hackers as a public good and as, as serving their communities. So for Alyssa Herrera, another hacker we spoke to, she, she's motivated to, quote, help further protect users and help for the, the standard of security, end quote. But I want to say as well that there are parallels to bug bounty platforms and other gig work platforms like Uber, as analyzed by Alex Ro Rosenblatt, who used to be at Data and Society Research Institute and is now at Uber. Um, platforms can glamorize work as heroic and for the public good. They can take advantage of workers' desires to do good and work in the world. And you know they pay people less. They they take advantage of them potentially because they frame their work as community service. Lastly, for almost all the hackers we spoke to, bug bounty work provides them with a sense of community, a sense of belonging, and of being known. At sometimes in a large and sometimes at a small scale as well. And this is something that can also be exploited and can be used to gamify um, bug bounty work, which leads very well into some of the risks of this labor. And, and to the next slide as well. Thanks, Yuan. So as Yuan mentioned, folks participate in this market for a variety of different reasons. For a significant subset, this is their job. It's not for beer money. It's not just a hobby, it's work. And for many of them, as Yuan just mentioned, it's a way of a hope that they will use this as a stepping stone to a career where they can engage in full-time work. It's really interesting to talk to these folks to hear about their frustrations and their pleasures. One of the things we see here echoed with other forms of gig work is that risks are disproportionately shifted on the workers themselves rather than the organizations. So the creation of bug bounty programs as they have been designed now puts workers in some ways at risk. There's legal protections are varied. Some programs offer safe harbors, others do not. So there's legal risks that are still there. We also see that there's significant risks of simply uncompensated time. Hackers are only paid when they're the first one to find a bug. If you're the second one, too bad. So there's this race to be first, which leads to an enormous amount of uncompensated time for the people participating in this market. Additionally, we see that the bug bounty programs themselves wield enormous power. They define what counts. There are sort of no real way to challenge that review or no meaningful ways to challenge that review in many cases. So what this means is, in other words, you could spend hours and hours looking for bugs, find a new submission, submit it, only be told, actually, it's not a valid issue, or it's out of scope, or it's a duplicate. And the hacker themselves has put all this time in with very little return. Now, this is fine if we think about hacking as a calling. It's fine if we think about hacking as a hobby. When we think about it as work, what we start to see is the risks disproportionately fall on the side of the workers. We also see there's challenges around access, how you get access to the most lucrative corners of the market, which are live hacking events or private programs, is often up for grabs. It's not clear. It requires workers to invest more and more time with the hopes of getting one of those invitations. And lastly, I'll say the risks here aren't just for the hackers themselves, they're for all of us. One of the big worries and one of the things we tease out in the report is this idea that in some cases, folks are trying to use bug bounty programs not as an added layer of security, but as a replacement for in-house security work. This is like a very grim irony. Hackers are participating in these markets with the hopes that someday they're going to land a job doing full-time security work. However, on the other side of the table, we see folks who think that this model, bounty work, digital piece work, as we describe in our report, is going to replace those very jobs they're trying to seek. And so this idea that the jobs themselves might disappear is something that is very worrying, not only for the workers themselves, but also for the rest of us. Because if we're going to defer to and rely on this sort of model of maintenance and security work, 
we're going to miss so much. We're going to live in a world that perpetuates bugs rather than fixes them at the root cause. Now, our report sometimes has a bit of a doom and gloom to it, but we're academics. Of course, there's doom and gloom. But what would we, you know, what else would we do? But at the end, we end with some very hopeful and I think encouraging recommendations. And so, Yuan, I'll turn it back over to you to conclude our sort of brief summary and talk about some of the more hopeful ideas we have for how this market might be reformed in a positive way. I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. And we do have recommendations because our, our report highlights a lot of the risks, but we do also wanted, we wanted to find solutions and begin mapping these solutions um, in order to better secure the working conditions of people doing this work and for security in general. The first recommendation that we have uh, and, and that came out of our work is that bug bounty programs should be just one layer of an organization's larger security posture. The security posture would look like how able an organization is to respond to bug reports, how, how, you know, how much they can actually patch the system. And security in a sense would refer to the protection of data, the protection of systems, the protection of intellectual property and many other things. Um, but as bounty programs are used for more uh, complicated problems potentially and for socio-technical problems to build off work by Matt Gertzen here, um, so, you know, an organization's posture will involve being able to handle reports for algorithmic bias and for problems like that. And, it, and it's really important that, you know, regardless of how and when bug bounty programs are used, that this work never be a replacement for full-time infrastructure work. In fact, you will need, um, uh, you know, you will need a team of people who respond to reports and who fix pro problems that are raised. And as we saw with the case of Netscape, it's far too easy to use bug bounty programs for PR. Um, and to draw on a uh, bug bounty expert and cybersecurity expert, Katie Mazuris, it's really easy as well for companies to use bug bounty as Botox, as she calls it, where bounty programs would be used to cover up um, um, systems and, and security postures that are in fact uh, not necessarily ready to handle uh, the receipt, you know, the reception of flaws, but then also where there are many flaws to be found, and that, and um, and you know, uh, for for basically in short, bug bounty programs um, can look really good, but it's really important that they have resources paired with them. That brings me to my second point: that bug bounty programs would require a huge amount of time, effort, skills, and organizational resources in order for programs to be effective. Workers we spoke to consistently spoke about the less than ideal working conditions and the uncertainty they faced related to slow response times, non-payment despite work being done, which is indeed a, a part of piecework. Um, for example, if you're a journalist and you publish an op-ed or if you publish a piece and no one wants to publish it, that is a normal, a normal thing in, in journalism, but it doesn't mean that this can't be improved. And it also, and you know, workers we, we spoke to said that there were valid flaws that they found, but maybe they'd be duplicates, or maybe that the company would say, this is not a flaw, but then they still, they'd patch it anyway. And there's also a clear lack of recognition, um, we found that hackers said for the work that they do. The third thing is that hackers also need better legal protection in order to safety dis safely disclose vulnerabilities. There are indeed certain carve outs for secur security research and anti hacking laws, both in Canada and the US, but good faith security researchers need legal protection that does not rely on the goodwill of organizations and companies not to pursue legal action. In another project of mine, I found that a promising legal approach is that in the Netherlands, where hacker intent and the steps that the hacker took to disclose are part of the decision making process for prosecutors before hackers face criminal liability for disclosure. So, for example, you may have seen the story of Trump when he was president and he had a really weak password and, a, and you know a Dutch hacker had actually found out what this password was, tried to disclose it to Trump's security team. No one took this hacker seriously. The hacker went public. In the US, it's quite possible and potentially even you know probable that this person would have faced serious legal risks. But in the Netherlands, what the prosecutor did there because there was a main prosecutor and, and they have um, a fairly uh, centralized system there for prosecution, prosecutorial decisions. The, prosecutor there decided that, you know, this person had exhausted the recourse, they had taken the steps necessary, which would mean that they wouldn't be responsible criminally for disclosing this information to the public because they intended to fix the system. The fourth thing is that, as Ryan mentioned, organizations and platforms that run bug bounty programs often serve many of the same functions as employers do, and they play a pivotal role in deciding how bug bounty, bug reports are handled. Bug bounty programs easily perpetuate the gig work norm of renting workers to draw on the work again of Alex Rosenblatt, but many workers crave stability beyond this precarious piecework. 
We think that classifying hackers and other bounty workers as employees and not independent contractors would open up opportunities for these workers to secure workplace legal protections and benefits. To go to the next slide as well, the fifth thing we wanted to say is that regardless of um, the you know, employment relationship, our research found that organizations need to be transparent about how they measure workers' performance and what their triage and dispute resolution processes are for bug reports. Workers we spoke to told us they didn't completely understand how people were invited to things like private events where an elite group of people be invited to hack first then get bigger payouts and be featured and, and to private events where, again, you'd be a trusted entity, you'd be a trusted person to hack first. Um, and you'd have many, many perks along with that, free flights to things and events and, and networking and all that kind of, and all that. And, if, and indeed, um, it's, it's very normal in an employment context that you are measured and you don't always know how you're measured, but that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a better standard for performance metrics in the world, in the world of hacking and for bug bounty workers. We also believe that all workers would benefit if there were increased clarity around how these perks, promotions, and prestigious invites were doled out, and particularly with respect to triage decisions. So if you say, I have a flaw, I'm going to submit this, it's, it's really important to be clear about what your process is for triage and for handling dispute resolution, because if you just ghost a worker, you're not going to build goodwill with people. Finally, we also really want to urge people to reconsider um, the approach that uses a global pool of insecure workers to maintain business models centered on rapid iteration and perpetual beta. And that's because this model and this approach can perpetuate the existence of security flaws because you rely on a market to be there because your business model functions upon and rests upon um, the idea that people will find flaws in systems and therefore you profit off of bugs. And this approach as well can solidify stratification across racial lines. What we found um, is that the bug bounty model can create the ideal conditions for exacerbating labor inequalities in IT work and can also create forms of predatory inclusion to draw on the work of Tracy McMillan Cotton that absorb vulnerable workers into hacking for wages in an extractive labor relationship. When bounty programs and platforms fail to address the impacts of their working conditions on certain communities, such as racialized workers, then these programs are not necessarily inclusive but can be exploitative. And I think it's important that. Um, combating racialized labor inequalities would be a part of this journey and part of uh, the direction of bounty programs in general. And this would require rethinking how workers are integrated into an organization and on what terms. So those are our recommendations, a little bit doom and gloom there at the end still, but we are indeed hopeful at the end. And I hope this summarizes well what our report has touched on and um, welcome any and excited to answer any questions you have about our report as well. Awesome. Thank you, Yuan. Uh, also, I just wanted to note, Yuan shouted out uh, some research I've done on the concept of socio-technical security. Thank you for that. I also want to acknowledge that Gabrielle Lim and Elizabeth Watkins uh, have been co-authors in some of the work I've published on that or be integral to those ideas. So thank you for referencing that. And who's up next, Josh or Camille? I can take it from here. All right, it's such a joy to be able to uh, present our work after Yuan, Ryan, and Matt, because we had the great pleasure of working on similar topics at the same time. And it was very reassuring to know that we were not alone in the rabbit hole and we benefited greatly from their insight, their research, and their work. And so I'm here today with my colleague, Josh, and we're representing the broader team behind a report called Bug Bounties for Algorithmic Harms, which was just published by the Algorithmic Justice League. And on this slide, you can see our co-authors, which are Sasha, Deb, and Joy. And this report looks at how people who work on minimizing algorithmic harm, so the field of algorithmic harms, can learn from InfoSec practices, particularly from bug bounties, but also from other types of vulnerability management programs. And we are particularly interested in what lessons they are for uh, vulnerability reporting and vulnerability disclosure. Um, you can read the full report at agl.org slash bugs. Uh, it's a bit longer than 100 pages, and we're not going to try to recap everything about the report. Uh, we're going to try to take you through a few vignettes to highlight bits and pieces here and there. Josh, over to you. Thanks, Kim. 
Uh, and likewise, uh, you know, thanks uh, to the folks at Columbia for, for having us today and, and to the awesome presenters beforehand. Uh, looking forward to this discussion uh, afterwards. So let's start with a little bit of, uh, you know, history behind uh, this report. Back in 2017, uh, when Dr. Joy Wallamwini, uh, founder of AJL, exposed how facial recognition technologies or, or FRTs fail more on, on women, uh, and on darker skinned people, and, and most of all on uh, women with darker skin. She and her research collaborators um, were met with a, a very adversarial reaction uh, from, from the industry that they were scrutinizing. Uh, FRT vendors responded by attempting to discredit the research and the researchers, um, but eventually they had to backtrack. Uh, and, and in particular, you know, this, this uh, this backtracking came about as a result in part of, of a NIST study that confirmed the findings uh, of their research. And this is an example of how there are, you know, parallels uh, in, in what's going on right now in the fight against algorithmic harm um, to the early history uh, of, of infosec or of sort of cybersecurity as, a, as an established discipline. Uh, and as, as uh, Ryan and Yuan just, just discussed, you know, the, you look back to sort of the, the 1990s and the early 2000s and companies were constantly attempting to, to discredit, to sue, uh, you know, even file uh, criminal charges uh, against hackers just for finding and sharing security vulnerabilities, including uh, with the sort of intent to, to fix those. But before we go any further, um, let's clarify what we mean by algorithmic harm. Um, so an algorithmic harm occurs, uh, we, we sort of speculate at AJL or not speculate, it's, it's uh, you know, based on the organization and the research that it comes from it, but this is our working definition. Uh, it occurs when an organization or an individual uses an algorithmic system to automate classification, prediction, recommendations, or scoring uh, in a process that harms people in some way. Uh, algorithmic harm can involve loss of freedom, or loss of opportunity, violation of rights or physical safety, social stigma, uh, or affronts to dignity, and, e and even loss of life. Um, and these days, people often talk about racial or gender bias in training data, and that is certainly uh, a part of this problem and a part of the causes of this problem. But algorithmic harm is not just about biased data. Uh, it can arise at or as a product of any stage in the life cycle uh, of an algorithmic system uh, or an AI system. Um, and uh, during data collection and classification, sure, but also in model development and testing or after uh, deployment uh, in the context of use uh, by real human beings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this isn't just hypothetical, this isn't theoretical. People in the real world experience algorithmic harm in all sorts of forms every single day. Um, for example, in 2020, um, the ACLU uh, filed suit on behalf of Robert Williams, who's pictured here, um, who was falsely arrested in front of his wife and two daughters uh, due to the failure of facial recognition technology deployed by the Detroit Police Department. He was mistakenly, wrongfully identified as someone who had committed a theft. Uh, algorithmic harms can be life-changing. Um, so the idea of rewarding folks uh, who might be well-positioned to help prevent them uh, or provide redress for them makes uh, a lot of sense in the abstract, similar to how rewarding hackers for discovering vulnerabilities uh, makes sense, but in both cases, uh, and again, as you know, you've already heard, uh, the devil is in the details. Uh, next slide, please. So to help us uh, more fully understand the draws and the drawbacks of bug bounties and whether they might really be useful for algorithmic harms, as some had speculated previously, we turn to sort of fellow practitioners and researchers, some familiar faces up there on the screen right now, uh, who were kind enough to share their wisdom, expertise, and ideas with us uh, for this report. Next slide and back over to you, Camp. And so as we promised, we're going to go through a few vignettes on the sort of history of the uh, Bug Bounty on a little journey. We are going to start with a somewhat wacky historical bounty as a way to highlight some of the central themes of our research, but also as a way to introduce our design levers. 
then we're going to jump ahead to the moment at which um, traditional infosec bounties start to encompass a greater range of socio-technical issues that's happening around 2018, which is a pivotal year for that. Then we're going to look at Twitter's bias bounty challenge from last year at DEF CON. And finally, we're going to close with a look ahead on what is happening right now with proctoring software and what this may suggest for the future of algorithmic harms bounty. All right, next slide, and that's the heavy one. Okay, so a key contribution of uh, this work, we hope, and again, we're here to be kept honest and to get uh, criticism and feedback and comments, but we wanted to really unpack the wide variety of bug bounties and associated mechanisms for reporting and disclosing vulnerabilities and abstract some key programmatic differences, which is what we call the design levers. And how these levers are configured for particular programs is really going to shape what they do for transparency, for accountability, for community building, and for some of these aspects that we really cared about looking into these programs to really understand how is it that we can best adapt it to the practices that we care about. And so in this uh, exercise, we are building on previous work, including work from Ryan in the article that you went cited. And this work had noted that these bug bounty programs tend to vary by how they define market access, program duration and compensation. And so we're adding on these levers to talk about whether public disclosure is guaranteed on a pre-established time frame. Uh, as you can guess, this is going to be extraordinarily important for both transparency and for accountability. We're also looking into how a given program is managed. Is it fully in-house or is it to some degree outsourced, for instance, to HackerOne, to BugCrowd or to a platform like this? What is officially considered in scope and what level of access are researchers actually given? Whether a program is voluntary or adversarial? In other words, has the target organization consented to receiving vulnerability reports? That dimension is one that's really important in our work because we have found, and we're gonna to return to this, that the adversarial programs haven't really found the right way to succeed in this space. Um, and with this, we can try to make those a little bit less abstract in applying this into a very old bounty. Josh, over to you. Yeah, so not at all to preempt or contradict the sort of origins of bounties as previously discussed. This is clearly an out of left field historical example. Um, but what the uh, this challenge lock, which uh, is up on the screen right now, uh, which is from the 18th century, what it what it sort of shows is, uh, you know, how the idea of of uh, exposing flaws in security, um, you know, it has a has a long history as a means of providing redress. So this lock was manufactured by Joseph Brahma, who was a locksmith uh, from the United Kingdom. Uh, it had almost 500 million possible uh, combinations. Uh, of course, most copies of this lock sold weren't uh, inscribed uh, in the way that you can see here. Rather, this particular lock was created to sit in Brahma's shop front as a kind of advertising, uh, you know, to the effect of, I'm so confident in strength of this lock that I'll pay you if you can pick it. Now, there's a familiar idea. Uh, well, Brahma's lock remained unbreakable and the bounty was uncollected for decades, 61 years. Uh, actually, until 1851, uh, when another locksmith, an American, uh, Alfred Charles Hobbs, succeeded in picking Brahma's lock after over 50 hours of tinkering over the course of two weeks. Uh, next slide, please. So considering this early, very early security bounty through the lens of our design levers, uh, we can observe that the challenge is voluntary rather than adversarial since the locksmith offered the challenge, compensated in the form of a one-time bounty and well compensated. Um, you know, 200 guineas was the prize, which is a little bit over $20,000 in today's currency. Uh, and just as with, uh, you know, uh, the, the many of the bounties that we see today, um, Hobbs being the first one to break it was the winner of the prize. Uh, subsequent, you know, lock picking wouldn't have, have earned a, another prize. Uh, in terms of disclosure, you know, Hobbs reportedly performed the feed in front of journalists, which is as about, uh, that's about as full disclosure as, it, as it's possible to get. Uh, and around the same time, 
Uh, Hobbes was actually also making the case for publishing weaknesses in lock design, uh, specifically in his 1853 book, Construction of Locks and Safes, Hobbes wrote that, quote, the spread of knowledge is necessary to give fair play to those who might suffer by ignorance. This was a bounty with open participation, anyone could participate, and the duration was ongoing, really ongoing, like 61 years ongoing. And lastly, regarding scope and access, focused on sort of picking the lock. So there was physical access there um, and, and complete access. You know, you could break the lock, I suppose, physically and inspect what was inside and the details of how it worked for public. So what does this show? Again, none of this is sort of new conceptually at, at a high abstract level. Um, and the idea of sort of compensation for finding uh, flaws in systems of assurance, whether it's security assurance or whatever, you know, these, these potentially can apply in various contexts. Uh, and you already know what happens next, uh, you know, well, well, pause 100 plus years, and what happens next is bug bounties come to InfoSec. Uh, next slide, and back to you, Camille. And so here we're going to take a ginormous leap forward and skip the wonderful and fascinating development of how and when bug bounties come to InfoSec, uh, not only because uh, our co-researchers here have done a great job at documenting it in their reports and have given some of this history on this panel. And we're going to sort of regroup in the early 2010. So at this point, uh, we're already seeing the widespread use of bug bounties, and it's often used in combination with vulnerability disclosure programs and with pen testing. We've already seen the rise of major bug bounty programs um, and platforms like HackerOne, Crown, and Yes, We Hack to sort of centralize them. And of course, we're after the first bug bounty programs by the US government, like Hack the Pentagon. At this point, uh, some of the largest players in tech use these platforms, these intermediary platforms, to solicit and triage reports. And as you and discussed, there are some upside for the hackers here. For instance, they use uh, those platforms. You offer a more consistent user experience. They offer access to many programs in one place. They offer a repository of past reports to learn from and often a community. Those are aspects that we were really interested in, in thinking about the emergence of a younger field like algorithmic harms, trying to think about what is the role that those templates, that those previous reports that this community can play in bringing about a community of practice. However, as we discussed at the beginning of this conversation, those are also the heady early days of the bug bounty everything hype uh, with some Wise researchers cautioning that bounties would not work unless the organization offering them are deeply committed to secure development practices throughout the entire product life cycle. And that is an insight that we think translates well in the algorithmic harm space, where there is often a lot of emphasis on the training data when we consider algorithmic harms. Often we hear people say, oh, if the algorithm is wrong, it's because the training data was biased. That can be a part of it. But of course, it's not the whole explanation. And if we want to meaningfully tackle algorithmic harms, we have to think about the entire life cycle. So long story short, uh, bounties have never been silver bullets. And when we fast forward again, we can arrive in 2018 which is the Cambridge Analytica moment. I think we can do next slide here. After Cambridge Analytica, we're quick, and we can also do next slide, sorry. We um, see very quickly Facebook and shortly after that Google announce a bug bounty for data and API abuse. Now that's really interesting because of course this is uh, quite similar to a bug bounty. It's kind of managed the same, but when you look into the details of it, it's substantially different because it really comes and stretch into those socio-technical issues. And at the end of the day, privacy abuse is meaningfully functionally different than a, a security bug. And so the other thing that we learn in this story and in this moment is the uh, PR values of bug bounties as band-aids in a crisis, which uh, Yuan and Ryan reminded us had a long history. And the last thing in 2018 that we thought was particularly interesting is one other organization out there, at least, with a bounty that seeks to surface algorithmic harms, and that's Rockstar Game. So Rockstar uh, is putting up this new bounty, we can go next slide, in response to claim of false positive ban punishments from gamers who have faced bans at the hands of 
Rockstar's cheat flagging algorithm. And so the company sets up this add-on to its traditional security bounty, promising a $10,000 reward for anyone who could successfully identify a, rep a reproducible incorrect ban in either Grand Theft Auto or in Red Dead. So if you're out there playing these games, know that the bounty is still up. So what are we learning overall from this expansion of bug bounties uh, to data and API abuse and then to cheat flagging algorithms that ha happens around 2018? And the first one is bug bounty programs can be applied to socio-technical challenges beyond security vulnerability. And more importantly, they have already started getting there, right? So our conclusion was also bug bounty programs are coming to a socio-technical issue near you. We see this trend already underway. We see this trend potentially accelerating. Now, some of this is good because there's indeed lessons from cybersecurity that we can stretch into new domain. Notably, for instance, thinking about how to better protect researchers who do this type of research. And this is where legal safe harbor can come and play a meaningful role. But we also realize that some of this really is again, meaningfully different and you can't just copy paste this model. You have to rethink what is it that you're trying to address? Who are you trying to address it with? And some of the thing that we cover in the report is also many times you need a different community of researchers to have bring a different perspective on these socio-technical harms. And we can pick this up in the discussion together, but we've also found that often the community of researchers that is most traditionally engaged in these traditional bug bounties program do not have the wide breadth diversity and inclusion that we would want in order to meaningfully tackle some of these other socio-technical issues. The last thing, of course, that gets confirmed in this moment in time is that bug bounty programs for algorithmic harms makes business sense to do for some specific companies at specific moments. For instance, if you need to address a PR concern or if you need to address um, a, a customer concern. So with this next vignette and over to you, Josh. Thanks. Okay, so recently for DEFCON 2021, uh, Twitter announced a one-week algorithmic bias bounty challenge. This program was created um, by the company's machine learning ethics, transparency, and accountability, or Meta team. They were the first Meta before um, Facebook decided on a rebrand, uh, and they did this bounty in partnership with Hacker One. It focused on an image cropping algorithm that users uh, had previously um, expressed, uh, you know, feelings that it was biased in ways that reinforced racism and sexism. Uh, and in 2020, these Twitter users had performed uh, a participatory audit, sharing screenshots of image crop fails um, on the social media platform, uh, which you can sort of see uh, here in the before picture. Um, In-house researchers from Twitter later published research confirming these users' findings, and through the DEF CON challenge, Twitter offered an opportunity for third-party researchers to again come in and scrutinize this model, um, this time with bounties for the top three submissions. Uh, and at the same time, the company also produced a scoring rubric for algorithmic bias and harms. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we were thrilled uh, at AJL to see this happen, and we think that Twitter did a lot of things right uh, in setting up this bounty. We also think that this case study, though, illustrates the difficulty of applying bug bounties um, to the problem of algorithmic harms. For example, their scoring rubric gave more points for problems that affected um, the most people, even though that implies deprioritizing uh, small groups of people who are at risk of suffering some of the worst kinds of algorithmic harm. Um, Twitter didn't provide any scores publicly, so it's hard to assess how sort of useful the rubric was in practice, um, but we're sort of really excited to see where that kind of, of framework um, can go from here. Uh, in addition, while it's you know great to see these kinds of programs emerging in response to controversies, in all the cases that we looked at um, of these sort of more uh, socio-technical bounties, so Google, Facebook, and Twitter, you know, the original reporters of the issues that precipitated uh, the emergence of these bounties, who first put in the work to document and expose the harms, aren't ultimately rewarded uh, aren't under these programs. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's an important change management lesson here, um, and in particular for those of, of you who sort of work in this space and how to how to you know make progress uh, under difficult internal conditions. Um, Twitter saw an opportunity where the stars were aligned in favor of doing something novel. 
Um, and in our interviews, we heard again and again the importance of finding the right pilot um, to sort of get the ball moving forward. For instance, with the Hack the Pentagon program, we heard from Lisa Wiswell about how critical the pilot was in, in ultimately motivating the proliferation of these programs across different government agencies. Um, and we think several factors here were key to minimizing the risk to the company and therefore willingness to sort of undertake this this pretty uh, novel approach. So first, the sort of harms from the image cropping algorithm had already been exposed by users. So the reputational damage had already been incurred by the company. Second, Twitter had already published an examination of the model's flaws and was already decommissioning the algorithm, uh, mitigating further risk of public criticism. Uh, and third, the cropping algorithm itself was open source rather than proprietary. So even by opening it up, uh, they weren't exposing any uh, IP. Uh, and you can see here as well on the screen, the sort of configuration of the program. And it, it's quite unusual. And again, happy to sort of come back around to that in, in the Q&A. Um, but with that, uh, back over to Cam. All right. Thanks, John. Next, next slide. Yes. Let's pivot to um, who else could use bounties for algorithmic harms. So this last vignette, we wanted to spend a little bit of time on what happened during the pandemic, where many schools, many universities switched very rapidly to remote learning. We know um, as educators, as students, how uh, difficult this was for everybody involved. And as part of this transition, we also saw the rapid adoption of e-proctoring systems to monitor students remotely. Now, there are a lot of known and documented problems with the systems. For instance, a lot of them use facial recognition technologies that perform less well on students with darker skin to the research that Josh initially mentioned that Joy, for instance, and her colleagues have published years ago. That part is well documented. We've also seen at least one researcher, Oxalibrium, on their blog Proctor Ninja, reverse engineer the widely used remote proctoring system Proctor.io to find that Proctor.io was using a facial recognition training library not meant for production environment and known to perform poorly on darker skin. So people who are subject to these technologies have been speaking up, like the students activists at Encode Justice, and they have been turning to both uh, participatory audits online to say, look, this is what I'm seeing on my screen. Are you seeing the same? I think this is a problem. And to more traditional reverse engineering techniques to go and document where those problems are coming from. So if we take a step back again to the um, history of bug bounties that we looked at, the other thing that really stayed with us is that the few attempts at truly adversarial programs did not last very long or did not succeed widely. There's a notable exception for programs who are vulnerability disclosure programs that live within large and well-funded corporations, for instance, Project Zero at Google. But beside these, this idea of adversarial bounties in a way or another form have not really find their final form. So at AGL, we were left with a simple idea. Josh, over to you. Uh, that simple idea is adversarial bounties for algorithmic harms. Uh, and these might be configured, uh, we thought, in the following way, uh, with adversarial reporting, uh, clues in the name, compensation, bounties, although certainly cognizant that there are um, situations in which other forms of compensation uh, would be more appropriate, depending on the nature of the work, uh, delayed full disclosure to ensure transparency and, and drive accountability, public participation to allow folks from um, different uh, communities, different research backgrounds, uh, and, and including sort of impacted folks to, um, to sort of participate, to contribute, and to provide their um, their, their, their forms of expertise. Um, program management would be third party as in a platform, but not, uh, we think, a platform uh, like uh, HackerOne or Bug Crowd or Yes We Hack um, that is, you know, for its business model dependent on uh, the custom of target organizations. Uh, rather, this would be an independent third party platform. Uh, and the thought initially is, you know, perhaps time limited, focused on particular sectors or spaces or problems would help to sort of, um, you know, uh, scope this to be feasible and 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 to sort of.
really drive attention towards, but also, uh, you know, being adversarial um, in nature, uh, you're not going to have access to the sort of full inner workings of the systems under scrutiny or the organizations uh, that produce those systems. So if something like this sounds exciting to you and you're interested in participating, uh, we invite you to sign up for AJL's mailing list. Uh, if you have ideas for targets of adversarial algorithmic harm bug bounties, please let us know. Uh, if you run your own adversarial algorithmic harm bounty and we've missed it, uh, we'd love to hear about it. Um, and I think we can move to the last slide just to, you know, point you all towards our report one more time. Uh, it's at ajl.org slash bugs. There's design lessons in there. Uh, there's case study on the Twitter program, all sorts. So thanks. And with that, I think we can go back over to Matt and open up the Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Um, I've learned, I've read the reports and I'm still learning from, from hearing all of this. That's a process. Um, so I've got like a stack of questions about an inch thick. And uh, I don't know which ones to ask first, frankly. But what, one of the things that I'm immediately thinking about on the heels of that kind of lines up with some of the questions we're already seeing in the chat. So maybe it's uh, maybe it'll be interesting to dig into that. Um, but bef before before I get before I do that, there's just one like really point blank question I want to ask to all of you, which is who needs to read these reports and what should they do when they read them? I mean, that's a hard question, but I think, you know, any, any slice of that you can take on, I would love to hear it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to go first. I mean, I think one place I would love the report to get read is for the folks running bounty programs generally. So that would be HackerOne, BugCrowd, and also folks who are interested in setting up their own bounty programs. I know, Every day, it seems like there's a new bounty program that spins out from, you know, public sector to private sector to universities. And I think just like a pause and thinking about some of the recommendations that we make at the end of our report um, would be so helpful. So that's that's one place where I certainly hope it could get read. Yeah, to add to that, I think that I know that the um, Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. has actually been trying to crack down on the differences between the uh, remuneration that is promised by platforms and then the remuneration that people receive. Uh, I can imagine that it would be of great interest to uh, the Federal Trade Commission to uh, identify uh, another place and opportunity in which uh, workers are being treated differently than they are than you know they're than they're, in terms of the promises that are, are being given to them. I would want lawmakers to read our report too because uh, both in terms of uh, workers who are in need of protection, but also because of the legal risks that hackers do face, particularly in the U.S., and because many of the companies that they hack on would be in the U.S. and indeed do pay for bug bounty programs. So I want lawmakers to better protect hackers as workers, as hackers, and um, and also to address one point. You know that uh, Ryan has made a few times, which I love, is that what do we do if bug bounty platforms like HackerOne and BugCrowd leave and, 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 and um, they run out of funding in an entire swaths of the industry and different industries are relying on these programs. I think that I, I, you know, alternatives are needed so that we don't rely on these companies to provide such important infrastructure and work regarding security. I'll take a last pivot from here and say that on our end, we, we wrote it for a wide variety of, of uh, audience from researchers to practitioners. We try to summarize some practical lessons in a design companion, but there are two audiences that we had in mind particularly. The first one is um, public interest technologists and, and civil society organizations for them to look at these uh, programs as potential ways to continue this, this work of uh, you know, founding algorithmic harms. And the second one is it's, it's apparent in the history of bug bounties that public institutions have also played an interesting role in putting out these programs and shaping the norms around how they are run. And we're interested in seeing if some relevant government agencies would also consider adversarial uh, bounties for algorithmic harms. Josh, did you want to add anything or do you think that uh, kind of gets it? Covered it. <laughs> All right. So there's been a couple of questions in the chat um, kind of honing in on uh, the difference between bug bounty programs and hackathons and generally the, the, the idea of like community building in these programs. And one of the things I find super interesting um, 
was the discussion of um, uh, kind of like public explorations of algorithmic uh, vulnerabilities or biases on Twitter. And that was something that, you know, people kind of did or and organized on their own. Uh, and then uh, Twitter kind of took the, took the ball running from that and, uh, you know, uh, hosted the DEF CON event. But one of the things, you know, um, that the Bounty Everything report talks about is how the, the early, you know, Netscape bug bounty, Bugs Bounty program uh, was very much like an attempt to kind of control the narrative and, and co-op, you know, co-op things. I think, you know, the, the report, the language it uses is, you know, to blunt negative attention and, and kind of enclose the, this, this market so that it could be controlled, right? So are there, are there in, you, in your reports, did you find like, is there some type of balance between companies that are able to like take this information from bounties programs running them versus the value of people doing it from the outside in kind of an uncontrolled way and being able to, to demand accountability in a public way. Um, what is like, is there a proper balance between that or do, do are both needed or is there, is it possible to have a bounty program that can really build that kind of community and, uh, and also serve that function if, if uh, I ask the question well? I have some thoughts and I might even answer another question while providing these thoughts, but someone has asked for our take on federal vulnerability disclosure policies and publicly funded bug bounty programs. And I have done work that looks at the Canadian government's use of vulnerability disclosure programs, which as we um, highlighted are bug bounty programs minus money. And I think it is possible to have bug bounty, uh, let's say vulnerability disclosure programs where people aren't paid. And what that means is that uh, there could be a sense of unfairness because you're not getting compensated for your labor, but by paying people for bug bounties, uh, that is bugs that, and bug reports they submit, then that means that you are creating a market and you're turning a person into a laborer. I think that there is a time and a place for not paying people because um, particularly from a, a state and government perspective, to pay people would be to turn the, th the thing you're paying for into a type of market. Um, so I, I think that there is a lot of uh, value actually in, in, in vulnerability disclosure programs that are run by governments where they pay people in things like swag or they just they say they, they pay you in, in, in recognition and I, it's hard to answer because you want to also respect the, commander, the hacker demand for payment as they did in, in um, at CanSec West, but I also think that there is benefit in having programs um, where you don't almost taint the relationship with money by, by turning things into a market. Did anyone else want to jump in on that? Or, right. Yeah, sure. I think um, to echo your question, like, is there a right balance between community building, transparency? Like, that's such an important question. I saw it pop up in the chat as well. People really enjoy working in this market, right? It's a thrill. They find friends. They find meaning in their work, and so those things are important to acknowledge and not discount. One of the tricky things, though, is how the desire to be part of that community can be sort of turned on its head. And so, getting access to that community, whether it be invited to private programs or invited to like lavishly funded live hackathons and live events in Las Vegas that are sponsored by platforms and companies. The desire to do that then drives engagement and it pushes often uncompensated work. And so it really is like a double edged sword. I think the trick that like gig work always is, is that it sets people with different motivations into a pool and pushes them against each other in some ways, whether they want to be pushed against each other or set against each other or not. And so the idea you have people here who consider bounty programs as beer money versus people who see it as their way to a career and or even their full time job. It creates these really strange and difficult dynamics that can make the sustaining of a community very difficult. And so that's one of the things that our report tried to get out is not to dismiss the fact that people find pleasure in community and friendship and engagement in these things. They do, but showing how it gets complicated when it's mixed in with these other dynamics. And I will say we have in the Q&A uh, a wonderful question by uh, one of our co-authors, uh, Sasha, who I think is here with us. And Sasha is pointing at some of the issues with disclosure too, right? So how can we help mandate 
more systematic disclosure. And, uh, you know, collectively, I think all of our report acknowledged a difficult relationship between the bounty programs and disclosure, where a lot of the by default settings is to prevent the disclosure of the flaws and vulnerabilities that are found. So I'm uh, highlighting this question by, by Sasha. Uh, and, uh, and if you allow me to do that, uh, getting it back on the on the stage. One thing that's really interesting and it's a, to, to follow up on that is the question of like when bug bounty programs like go wrong and how they can be used to catch and kill, right? So we have examples in our report about Uber, which I think is a very well-known story now where the CISO was brought up on federal charges because they essentially tried to cover up a data breach through their bug bounty program. Like, don't do that. That's not what bug bounty programs are supposed to be for. We also have stories from John Deere and others that are trying to use their bug bounty program as catch and kill. So the question here about how we think about disclosure and how do you create a world where bug bounty programs can be used to help get flaws out in the world rather than to cover them up is so important. And it's, it's tricky, it's difficult. I mean, I think the federal case around Uber is gonna make people very nervous. Um, but the other thing that we can do is hackers have power here. They have real power by which programs they decide to participate in. And looking at the terms of service and picking and choosing based on those that allow for disclosure versus those that are going to require NDAs. And so the hackers themselves have maybe sometimes more power than they might realize. One of the things that we try to emphasize is that this work is very difficult. We hear these like eye popping numbers that there's tens or hundreds of thousands of people signed up to participate in bug bounty programs, which is true. But there's a much smaller group of people who are incredibly effective and successful, and they have real power to shape how this market works as well, if they are willing to take it, if they're willing to make those choices and make those choices publicly. So I think that's one way in which we can push for, um, maybe not regulators themselves pushing for it, but the hackers and participants themselves can help be sort of that forcing function around disclosure. I mean, that leads nicely into one of the things that we were sort of thinking about in the context of how to make um, adversarial programs work a little bit better than they have historically, which is, you know, these, barriers of varying um, firmness, uh, these sort of legal threats uh, that exist to disclosure, um, and that whether they are, you know, whether they are realistic in terms of the hacker will end up incarcerated, or whether they are just a, a looming threat. Um, I think it's been pretty well documented at this point that both of those create a chilling effect uh, on what people research and what happens to that research when they find things. And so this is this is one of the key points that we want to sort of put out there in the world with respect to potential, you know, um, sort of adversarial platform successes to the likes of, of Wu Yun to Open Bug Bounty is, is we need to have support in place um, that can't be just reliance on legal safe harbor because that's not going to be offered by organizations who don't want to have uh, the flaws uh, in and about their systems exposed. Um, they're not going to offer that. And so what are the alternatives that are out there? Sure, there are some, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Yuan spoke earlier about, you know, pro prosecutorial guidance to sort of take away that particular threat in places where that can be feasibly achieved and where uh, governments understand these issues well. But then there's also just a lot uh, of, of potential benefit, I think, to be gained by having intermediating organizations that can say, we have your back. Uh, whether it's resourcing, whether it's legal guidance that's provided ahead of time, um, level setting on the playing field of, of what they are going to have your back on um, can, can probably go quite a long way. I mean, if Legal Safe Harbor can solve as many problems as it has in the bug bounty space, um, then presumably having a well-resourced intermediary that truly does have the back of the people doing the scrutiny um, could, could, could support as well. Um, that's obviously not going to get off to all of the challenges of, of sort of um, cutting out some of the misaligned incentives that exist in this ecosystem right now, um, but it would certainly help address some of the sort of knock-on effects. Uh, don't know if any others have thoughts on that. Maybe I can add a thought that um, uh... I've been thinking, you know, it's a bit in my head for a while. Um, back before uh, Ryan and I were writing a report, but we're doing the research, 
we had this um, event at Dayton Society um, where we had feedback on, on, uh, on the work we were doing thus far. Matt was there, um, other people, Iha as well, who works at Dayton Society. And she actually pointed out that there is, that she saw similarities between hackers and screenwriters. And she said, you know, you might want to look into screenwriters guilds and writers guilds. And I actually haven't looked into that, unfortunately, but I think there's a lot there. And I say that for two reasons. The first is that um, there's this notion of labor where you know you're doing labor, it feels it feels like play. Um, and there, and I actually think of hacking as a creative field um, where you are very creative in your work often and you produce outputs, like much like you would when you are creating film or TV. And what, what I can see is that the Screenwriters Guild emerged and it's, it acts as a sort of union and it protects many, many workers. And so there is a question here about what are recommendations for hackers? And I think that it would be amazing if groups of hackers had you know, formed unions and, and um, guilds that would protect them as workers and that would advocate for them to receive certain compensation or to be acknowledged in certain ways. And I think that that movement would be really needed and would be really beneficial for protecting the rights of hackers as hackers and as workers. Okay. Um, that leads me to uh, something I was thinking about. Uh, like one of the really top line recommendations of the AGL report in particular is um, the need, especially as we move into uh, you know, the idea of bounties for algorithmic harms or socio-technical harms of increasing the diversity and the pool of the, the people who are actually participating in these programs so that they can surface uh, harms that might be visible to them from their subject position but not, might not be visible to others or others might not even think to look at. Um, but it seems to me like, is there is there a bit of a wicked problem between that kind of imperative and also the imperative to improve job security and pathways to secure employment for the existing pool of laborers? I mean, there's gotta be some way to balance that kind of tension of wanting to draw in as, as, as many people from as many diverse perspectives with as many skill sets as possible, and also make sure that these people are not, not being treated to the worst effects of casualized labor. Um, and I, I guess that gets back to some extent to the idea of how people who are voluntarily doing this as communities aren't necessarily expecting to be rewarded, but they should be as well. So I'm just curious if, if you have thoughts on that. It's a very hard problem. I'm sorry to, to, to put it out there, but if anyone knows, hopefully it's you guys. I mean, I can, I can, I can sort of speculate. I think you are right. It is a, it is a wicked problem. And if we look across our technology ecosystem more broadly right now, um, the challenges of, of building diverse, inclusive communities, absolutely with respect to background, um, uh, but also with respect to sort of, you know, professional expertise, research interests and methods and so on. Like this is not something that we have got answers to today. I do think there are places, um, you know, that are looking at how to do this uh, and, and, and making progress. My um, sense based on our research is that uh, there's not going to be a sort of one size fits all solution with respect to sort of the institutions that can facilitate community building, let alone the programs that those um, institutions might offer to um, attract in participants to protect them in the various ways that they need to be protected and to compensate them where they are producing um, something of value. Um, but the question of who gets to determine what is valuable and what um, kinds of work and contributions deserve to be compensated. I mean, this ties into what are your templates? What are your impact scoring frameworks? Who contributed to um, to building those. The idea that sort of certain work has value in this space and, and others, that, that's a political question and it's a social question and a cultural question. And so, you, you know, you sort of have to have, I think, a, an open-mindedness to, um, to, to, to work out what solution, you know, to, to trial and error, to work with stakeholders and communities to figure out what solutions are going to work for them best. And, and the idea that we're going to come in in a panel today and be like, yes, if you do X, Y, Z, you will have a diverse community of practitioners on your platform. 
no, uh, you're, you're right, we're not, um, and, and that's okay. Thanks. Did anyone else want to weigh in on that, or should we move on to a lighter, <laughs> a lighter uh, affair? Okay. Um, so that also that uh, touches on a couple other directions we can take this. One is exploring the idea of the security development life cycle a little bit more, and uh, one is exploring the kind of role that these kind of existing institutions in the bug bounty space place. So let's see, maybe I'll go with the latter one first. So as, as Josh's answer kind of just suggests, like some of these existing big players in the, you know, bug bounty infosec space are starting to also move into, you know, providing a, their existing infrastructure and platform for more algorithmic harm type issues. Um, is there, what are the kind of, you know, pros and cons of seeing that happen versus having you know new organizations kind of come up and try to try to start you know develop protocols for these types of bug bounty programs from scratch suited to you know algorithmic harms in particular yeah it's a great question Matt. i'm going to try not to answer we wrote 100 pages about this <laughs> but it was sort of one of the key questions which is you know what is it take to meaningfully take those programs and stretch them to those socio-technical issues. To your question on like things that immediately come to mind as trade-offs, when you use uh, platforms who've been managing programs for a long time, like they can accompany those, you know, those, those companies and like, how do you do triage? How do you develop an impact scoring? Uh, how do you make sure that you recruit for your program? How do you pay people? And so they make that transition uh, much easier. Now, the other thing, of course, that comes with that is, you know, you also don't have adversarial programs. By definition here, you have programs that are hosted on platforms by targets who have agreed and who are participating. And as a result, you're also targeting the um, sort of existing community of people who participate in these uh, platforms. And we can talk a little bit more. Uh, there was an interesting uh, you know, set of questions in the chat about the lack of diversity uh, of the current communities who most often engage with these types of programs. So again, if we go through all of our, our leverage, we can, um, we can spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out like, all right, is this a good first step, right? Like we definitely think that it is. We think it's important to have these programs. We're grateful that we have a little bit of transparency. Of course, as researchers, we always want more transparency. I think Josh said it, we really wanted to see how those uh, scoring framework had been applied to the different submissions. So, you know, using these platforms is, is an interesting first step in stretching these programs, but then you also end up in situations where, um, you know, some of the harder questions of what needs to be done differently for these models to succeed on issues that are fundamentally different uh, doesn't, doesn't really get, I think, the full treatment that it sometimes deserves. One interesting like follow-on point um, that recalls this, I don't think it made it into our report, but one of the interesting conversations we had was talking to someone who had set up a bug bounty program inside a large public agency organization. And when they talked about it, that one of the measures of success that they had in their mind was that it allowed them to argue internally to their managers and their higher ups, that things needed to change. And so beyond the value of like a particular bug or particular submission, it allowed them to say like, we need to change our contracting policies, we need to change sort of how we do development and testing all these other things. And so it occurs to me that thinking about the value of like an experiment like the Twitter um, and other socio technical experiments, some of the value might be that they enable folks who are already trying to work for change inside to have the power and the resources and something they can point to that allows them to advocate for those changes more effectively internally. That's not like, that certainly wasn't the way I thought about bug bounty programs going into this, but certainly it was an interesting wrinkle that sort of Camille hearing you talk about it made me think about that as well. And just to be clear, Ryan, like we totally agree and we think there's a lot of value in that, right? Like we've seen over and over practitioners talk to us about like book bounties as a way to accelerate change and then a way to sort of demonstrate that more transparency is possible to demonstrate that more scrutiny can uh, can lead to good outcomes. So there's definitely um, 
you know, change management of value to, to these book bounty programs. Yeah, I mean, doubling down on that, I think if you asked even some of the executives at bug bounty platforms, they know that the organizations who are doing this the most impactfully and effectively sure in dollars and cents terms for these companies, but those who are doing it really well, they're doing root cause analysis on vulnerabilities, which not every organization does. Some, some say they do, they, they don't. Um, you know, they are looking for the reasons why these things occurred. And that then does tie into <laughs> Matt's first question, which we, you know, I guess maybe we can pivot back to of, of you know, what, what does the life cycle look like? And, and, and where do these lessons apply? Um, and are you willing to go beyond, you know, technical fixes to look at organizational questions, processes, controls, culture, that form the sort of underlying bedrock of why security is a relentless uphill battle. Um, I think if we look across it, you know, for, for algorithmic harms, you know, for example, to, to it's, 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 as Cam said, you can't map across perfectly. And an algorithmic, you know, a sort of algorithmic harms, uh, an, an algorithmic system life cycle that has the right components in place to address all the myriad harms is, is going to include a data governance life cycle. Uh, it's going, you know, it's, it needs to be more than just industry setting what this life cycle looks like. You have to bring in community organizations so that you can understand what are the risks on the back end when the products are being used. Uh, and what are the different risk domains? There are security risks in AI, which also implicate fairness, um, as well as sort of inherent characteristics of the products being deployed. Um, and, and, you know, how do you tie these pieces together? And how do you learn from reports in ways that are meaningfully impactful across that life cycle, I think is, is a wide open question um, for sort of uh, AI practitioners, scholars, communities of all shapes and sizes to sort of help you know, work through. Um, but that's where the real value comes from is, is can you tie this back into what is going wrong at the organizational route with people, with processes, you know, there are humans behind and in front of technology uh, and Matt, perhaps that's an area where we can turn the question back to you and say, you know, what are sort of some of the, you know, what are some of the lessons here for security bug bounties of how to address the sort of socio-technical characteristics of these problems more effectively than they do today. Yeah, so, well, that actually ties, <laughs> I'm gonna answer that by asking the next question that I was formulating in my head for you, because, you know, one, one thing, my understanding of early, uh, you know, software development, security de development lifecycle type of practices and processes was that, one thing that was very important was like vulnerability databases. And I think this, this gets to some of the questions that are in the chat and kind of synthesize them together because one of the things disclosure allowed was for you know, different people to gather various vulnerabilities, classify them by different types, see when they remained you know, in existence. Uh, it allowed engineers or developers to have an awareness of where other people had gone wrong so that when they start building their software, they could incorporate those you know, known problems and address them preemptively. So one thing like I've, I've wondered is like, what, is, is there anything like a vulnerability database being developed for algorithmic harms, socio-technical harms? How you know how integral is that to an effective SDL you know type of thing type of framework for algorithmic systems? What are the you know what are the things stopping that from happening? How do bug bounty programs relate to that? I'm just curious if any of you have thoughts on that, or if you know of any any projects already at, you know in, in, ex, in ex, ex, existent on that front. Yeah, Matt, I'm so glad that you brought this up because this is something that we got really excited about in thinking about what is it, you know, what would it mean to translate the uh, central and public uh, databases for vulnerabilities to the space of algorithmic harms? I think there are a lot of um, ways in which 
this makes sense, and not only because you also see some of the uh, same problems of having underlying pieces of technologies or underlying databases that are used by multiple projects, and it can help the transparency, and it can help uh, the accountability. That being said, I think here, uh, and we already have some examples of some of these databases appearing. Uh, Josh can talk about a few, a few of them, but I will say, I think the, the difficulty is you have to circle around what is the topic that you're aiming to cover. Um, back to your last question, a metaphor that we really liked and, and used is what uh, Katie Musuri calls the digestive systems that are needed for bug bounties, right? So point that Josh was explaining, if you are opening yourself to receiving bugs, you need the digestive systems internally to actually process those bugs and you need the teams on the other side to unpack them and to address them. And when we take the entire space of social technical harms, we realize that those digestive systems in industry are so scattered and different, right? So the people mm. who will address, for instance, some of these algorithmic harms on the machine learning side are very different people than some of the other type of issues that should be routed through the trust and safety teams or the anti-cheat teams. And so I think that the first question is like, yes, this is a super promising idea. We would love to see more people working on this. What would it mean to create those centralized uh, databases? And I think that in order to succeed at it, you would have to be super specific on which actual type of harm are you trying to circle around? And does this type of harm have kind of I don't want to call it unified digestive system because it sounds like a bizarre metaphor now, but like, do, do we have some form of agreements on where does it go and where does it need to be digested? Um, Josh, over to you. I know that you and I have had long, long conversations around this. Yeah, and I'll try not to, I'll try not to be as long-winded on this one as I was on the last. I mean, I think there's, there's some nascent projects out there. I know that in the course of sort of other crash project research streams um, and community engagement work, we came across a uh, partnership on AI's artificial intelligence incident database. Um, but I think that, you know, you hit the nail on the head with what are, what is it that we are taxonomizing or planning to taxonomize, planning to itemize here. Um, incidents are tracked separately from vulnerabilities in the cybersecurity space. Um, we shouldn't necessarily assume, you know, that harms versus, um, the sort of sources of harm should be uh, tracked collectively together. They should tie together, but but you know that that is I think uh, something to consider. Um, I would just suggest that you know double down on the more visibility we can get here, the more thoughtfully we can start organizing these these things and understanding how to prevent them um, in a in a sort of structured way. Um, and you know if there's if, there, if there's, I mean, there's many lessons in the history of bug bounties uh, for today's cybersecurity practitioners, um, but perhaps there's, there's a key one there, which is, I, I don't think we are getting the, the value out of this as a, you know, across, across the sort of security space as we could be from bug bounties, from vulnerability disclosure programs, because even when things get fixed, they generally don't get disclosed. I mean, we read through hundreds of program terms from HackerOne and it was a small minority that afforded any kind of, you know, uh, guarantee of subsequent disclosure upon, for example, on patching or 90 days or 120 days. And this is what we're getting at with these, you know, independent intermediaries and what they can achieve. Google Project Zero, they say, you know, X days later, we are going to release this vulnerability with details, you know, and, and, and they do and they can do that because, you know, they are empowered in this ecosystem. Um, to to sort of speak in that way, um, and and I think what can we learn from sort of that model and to to bring back and to scale up the the sort of learnings that we get out of out of vulnerability disclosure and um, really actually start to get off to some of the um, you know the fundamental misaligned economic incentives in tech space when it comes to security. I I think this. This is promising, but we have to figure out how to get past the nobody wants to talk about X problem. I wanted to chime in too. Um, I think Camille, you really highlighted well how if you're going to have a database, it need, it's harder in some ways when you when it comes to algorithmic harm and bias and accountability because systems are so different, and what harm means in a certain context 
um, is going to be different in another context. I did want to share two links. I didn't know about this incident, um, AI incident um, database, which is super interesting. So I'll, I'll just share a link to that for anyone interested. Thank you for mentioning that, Josh. And then the very sexy topic of vulnerability databases um, also brings me to the, the first link I shared. Um, I, I would think that there is much value in having a database of AI incidents, but acknowledging the issues that you raised, Camille. And then I also can't help but think of your work, Matt, where in a way, um, uh, email lists where, where hackers would disclose flaws they found was served as a sort of database. It's just that it, that's, it was harder to search for. It wasn't, you know, information wasn't necessarily indexed in the same way. Um, and I think before there would be um, a really useful database of our algorithmic harms, I think it would need to, you know, there would need to be research on how are these vulnerability programs or databases being used in, in cybersecurity, more traditionally understood, how, you know, who visits them, how does that inform other people's work, and then you'd want to figure out, you know, what taxonomies, like you mentioned, Josh, would make sense in the algorithmic harm space, um, because otherwise, if you just create a database, it could just exist in the ether. At the same time, I'm also conscious of other work that I feel like you've um, done too, Matt, where you've tried to catalog the um, affordances of things like social media platforms and the harms that can arise, but they can also be features as someone mentioned in the Q&A. And I think those kind of databases are really valuable as well. And I know that there's actually um, a US freedom of the press tracker where journalists are trying to track how um, uh, they've been treated by governments, by entities in terms of harm and that they experience and the work that they do. And I think of that as a kind of database as well that you know, serve as inspiration, but I think more research would be needed and especially in order for this kind of database to be useful when it comes to AI harms. Yeah, there, oh, sorry, Ryan, go ahead. No, just to, to reiterate and emphasize, um, one of the things we found in our interviews is like the common source of frustration for people working on the InfoSec bug bounty side is like what counts as a valid flaw is so deeply contested. And so I think it's attractive as outsiders think, well, in the technical world, flaws are clear. The socio-technical world squishy, like they're squishy all the way down. And so thinking about common taxonomies, databases, like it is so important because it's a, such a recurring point of friction, even on the technical side, that when you move into the world of socio-technical harms, it's gonna be so open to, competing interpretations and contestation that anything you could do to have like baselines and agreed upon metrics or agreed upon frameworks that aren't just um, defined by one organization or one institution would be really helpful, right? Because it's like a recurring point of friction that drives the participants absolutely batty with good reason. So I think that just underlines the point of like why this is both needed and also the, the hazards or risks of thinking about like where would it live, where would it sit and how could it be developed? Yeah, I just want to echo echo this point by Ryan. I think, um, you know, and there's a great question in the chat too about have we given some thought about the ways in which uh, algorithmic harms and cybersecurity bugs are different. We wrote an entire section on this. I can I can uh, send the, the specific portion of the report, but I think the what Ryan is saying is so important, right? We have a tendency to say like, oh, isn't it nice on the cybersecurity side that everybody agrees on whether it's a bug and whether you can fix it? And you say this to a, to a hacker or to someone who routinely participates in a bug bounty and they just laugh you out of the room, right? There's so much dispute, so much uh, interesting and fascinating questions on what's in scope, out of scope, what's a feature, what's a bug, what's fixable, what has been fixed, uh, what is duplicative. And I think this is also part of the what we're hoping to learn, right? Like um, none of this is, is, is trivial. All of this is actually quite complicated. And so it's interesting and important to see those mechanisms that have been set up to address these um, these questions and which way have they worked and in which ways have they failed, right? Which is why we really enjoyed reading Yuan and Ryan's uh, examination of um, uh, dispute resolution mechanisms in bug bounty programs and in which ways uh, do they help clarify uh, what, what, what really we were trying to solve with, uh, with bug reporting and vulnerability management. I Maybe mean, I can just add to that, actually. Um, I, I think that it's just a, that you, you, these are all such good points. And maybe um, that perhaps it could it, it could make sense then for there to be many databases of AI harms and that maybe certain communities decide for them what is an, what is a harm to them, just as journalists are creating this database in the US and they're going to be doing like I know people are doing this in, the, in Canada 
where they're saying, here are the harms we face or here are the risks we face. We want to catalog this for transparency, for accountability, and to and so that people can learn from us. And in terms of freedom of information requests and even being and, and harassed by police or, or or arrested by them for doing their journalistic and uh, work. And, and, and I, I think that it could make sense for communities themselves to decide what constitutes harm. And I can't help but think of Sasha's work on this topic of participatory design and how the human, um, the people who are most impacted by um, the harms of a system might be the best place to decide what, what we talk, what, what we mean when we say harm or, or weakness or security or even exploit. I will paste the link to Sasha's wonderful book, Design Justice for Everybody in the chat. Yeah, that's a great reference. Sorry, go ahead, Josh. I was just going to put an exclamation point on that. I mean, you look at sort of the way that CVSS, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System works, and there is a base score, a sort of temporal score, you know, and then an environmental score, which is supposed to figure in context. Um, it doesn't work perfectly, um, but there is at least an acknowledgement, even in that sort of, you know, uh, component of the metric that it matters where a vulnerability sits in a system and who is interacting with that system, who is authorized and, and able to access that system and, and sort of what are the, you know, the sort of more socio-technical elements of it, you know, what data is flowing through this vulnerable system. You know, those things really matter whether you can access something that you shouldn't be able to access is sort of secondary to what are the effects of that access and we definitely do identify some distinctions between algorithmic harms as a sort of outcome versus vulnerabilities as a mechanism towards an outcome that can be harmful um, and there's there's some stuff to unpack in there but these the i think a lot of the issues that we've seen in security in the last 25 years um, have at their root some in some part um, a failure to acknowledge uh, that this is these are socio-technical problems and if we could start getting after that and if that comes about as a result of you know other socio-technical issues being taken more seriously i think that would be a really great thing uh, for the for the sort of so for cybersecurity practitioners and and ultimately the sort of users and and subjects of, of tech just want to quickly pick up on that because I think Josh is, is talking about something that's really important and that Matt, your writing has really helped illuminate, which is cybersecurity itself is really dealing with its own borders and expanding as a field. InfoSec is expanding into a right. What are all those socio-technical issues that are adjacent? Which ones are InfoSec? Which ones are not? We've seen some of these discussions fascinating with privacy, as we said, API abuse. Um, you know, closer to, to, to my work, I think I've really seen this in the way InfoSec tackled information operations as some of these were indeed conducted by traditional APT actors that the field was very familiar with, and some of that felt very much close to close to the field, another dimension of it felt very far from it. So I think that what we're talking about is also a field that's very much in movement, very much negotiating its own boundaries. Uh, and what our small hope was that, you know, on the socio-technical side, we could extract some lessons for people working on algorithmic harms, but perhaps too, there are some lessons from people who work closer to the socio-technical side of, of things that can help InfoSec and overall the cybersecurity field in its own transition to better understanding what's um, on its borders, on the frontiers of the field. Sorry if that was very abstract. No, this is what, I mean, I love the, this to, this got into such abstract kind of epistemological questions because I think that's really where a lot of these problems are at, which is interesting. And I mean, that's not just from our discussion. These are also the types of questions that are repeating over and over in the chat. And it's just reminding me that, you know, even passwords were even controversial on, you know, shared mainframes because some people saw that as anti- you know, opposed to the philosophy of shared resources. And there's always going to be, I mean, maybe maybe buffer overflow attacks and things like that are an example of something that probably everyone agreed was a, a, tech, a security challenge, but there's always going to be a political dimension that's informed by where people are doing the analysis from. And 
it's it's I'm very excited to see where people take that uh, and and how this work contributes to it. Um, but we are you know running low on time, so maybe instead of getting more abstract, my brain's already worrying. We can we can track back to a couple um, more concrete questions. I mean, one is you know one of the panelists noted in our panelist chat that there's so much agreement on different issues, but I was wondering when, when you were each reading each other's reports, were there any insights or uh, findings that you found particularly interesting that you hadn't hit upon in your own work? Um, I, I, yeah, is that, a, is, that, is that a fair question? I mean, it's not something I disagree with, but I was very struck by, you know, the, the, the deep, digging that Yuan and, and Ryan did on the Netscape bounty, uh, I think is something that will, that there's a sort of section of their paper that has, is worth reading, even aside from everything else that's worth reading in their paper. It is, you know, how persistent is the idea that you can use these kinds of mechanisms to just shoo a PR problem under the rug? Well, it was the from the first one onwards. Um, so I was very struck by that and, and really enjoyed reading that part in particular. Um, Cam, I know you were about to jump yeah. in there as well. No, I was going to say, I think some of the first thing that that was very odd for, for us when we started this research project is that initially we thought it was going to be short and we were going to get away with a small paper, which of course we massively failed at this. And one of the first thing that was just very puzzling is how much feelings and disagreements people had on bug bounties and they would just you know like our interviewees they would just like really disagree with each other's and it would be different schools of bug bounties and such strong disagreements within the field and i think at first it was a bit head spinny for us being like what? how is it that people can disagree on everything here so much including the history of bug bounties what is or is not a bug bounties things on which you could see like you know you you you, you could conceive perhaps that they would be more agreement and um I feel for us it's at that time that we uh, met Yuan and Ryan, whose research was very grounding, both in putting some, you know, some some semblance of like, all right, this, these are the things that are actually documented that people align on, and perhaps on explaining some of the deeper dynamic that explained some of the passion and disagreements that we very quickly saw. And I will admit that we that we took a, a hot second to to process and unpack. One thing, I mean, I learned so much from reading um, Matt, your report, as well as Josh Akil, your report, but one thing that like wasn't front of mind for me when I was doing this work was thinking about like this alternative model of adversarial bounties, like how useful it might be, how fraud it might be, how difficult it can be, but really ultimately how useful. Um, in our space of the InfoSec world, adversarial bounties like don't really, they're not really there. That's not where the market went. If you talk about adversarial bounty, it kind of looks more like the offensive market, right? People buying and selling exploit kits, like that's the adversarial market, which is beyond the scope of sort of what we look into for a variety of reasons. But it made me wonder like um, in a very serious way, like did we institutionalize the wrong model here? Like did bug bounties evolve in a way through good intentions and bad intentions and happenstance and everything else that we detailed, did we institutionalize the, the wrong model? And so reading Camille and Josh's work and their report from AJL more generally, it made me think like, here we have a chance maybe to get it right. And I hope we do. And so that was something I took away that was not, you know, on my radar at all, one of the many things, but really resonated with me reading the report and resonated even more today hearing um, it talked about in such a clear way. So we were supposed to disagree. Now here we are just patting each other on the back again. We failed. We failed in writing short reports and we failed in arguing. Oh no. Um. Okay, so yeah, so I'm I'm walking away from this thinking like I mean, there's this one big level of challenges, which is you know how do we even think of what the buckets and the classifications and these kind of epistemological challenge. And there's also this very pressing, much more concrete need just to bring people, you know, a more diverse pool of people who can identify uh, more you know a wider range of of issues and also be heard right to amplify them. And these are two two big challenges. I'm I'm also curious, you know, if, if having finished this work, what are was there were there any things that you wished you could answer that you couldn't get at, or things that you would like 
you know, the students or other researchers who are watching this or reading a report to kind of pick up on and, and continue the thread forward to, um, you know, for, for the next round of phase of research on this important to uh, topic. Um, I have thoughts immediately on that. Um, and the first thing I think of is the question of labor issues. And our report, you know, focuses significantly on the working conditions and labor issues related to bug bunny programs and bounty programs in general. I don't think we've solved the problem and I don't know if there ever will be a solved problem here, but I don't know if we have uh, solved the problem of figuring out what the solution looks like. I did mention the idea of, of creating a guilds or, or groups of hackers, aka unions, who would advocate for baseline standards of treatment. That seems like a really great way forward. Courting that will be extremely hard given the international um, labor market we're dealing with. Whereas in, in you know historically and typically unions are, are based on people who work at least in a country um, because you have certain rules that are applied in your region and, and by the governments um, that have jurisdiction where you live. And so with, with that said, I think that how will the labor conditions improve in this market? That is an open question. And I would hope that um, people begin working on that because we've looked at how hackers experience this. We've looked at um, um, what people's experience of, of this market is. And we, we know that many derive benefit from it. Um, many love this field. They love working in this in, in this um, field and, and doing this work. And I would assume that it's going to be the same case for algorithmic, algorithmic harms. Um, but I hope that there is uh, more work and better answers to the question of how do hackers and how do workers and infrastructure workers protect their rights because of the issues that we've highlighted. There's two things I really wish I could know and hope to find out in the future. The first is like, we look so much on the side of the labor of the people who are finding and disclosing bugs. I would love to know more about the people who have the most thankless job in the world, which is triaging the incoming reports and bugs. So like seeing their perspective, understanding how the market works from their view is something I would love to know more about and I hope to find out in the future. The other thing that I would love to know more about if I could wave my magic wand is to get access to sort of the books for the bug bounty platforms. Like I am dying to know about more details about their financial model. Are they going to survive? Are they going to make it? Um, these are big VC backed companies, but they've been around now, they're coming up on a decade and they've become important parts of the vulnerability disclosure pipeline for many, many companies. And in the back of my mind, I have like a real serious worry about what happens if they go away. Um, Cause we built a lot of things on that foundation, but we still don't really understand like the plumbing of those companies in a way that I would like to know. So that would be, if I could wave, wave my wand, go back to the plumbing slash digestive metaphors. I wanna know more about the financing on that side. So those are my two, my two things I'd like to know more about. Right, and if I could say like, hey, we've built a lot of things on this foundation, but does anyone have any clear idea of the plumbing is the overall story of cybersecurity. Seems like a problem, seems like a problem. <laughs> Um, I think there's so much uh, that, that we would love to know more about. I'm hoping that our rep report sort of helps, uh, you know, give, give others research directions from what happened to adversarial bounties to or how do some of these concepts translate to other spaces. I will add a, a small note of something that came up in our work, which is doing this work with the perspective of um, inclusion in mind and translating to spaces that are very uh, more socio-technical and perhaps more aware of uh, the language we use and how we talk about this and how words shape, uh, shape who participates and how those programs are seen. We struggled a bit with the vocabulary that is widely used in InfoSec, starting with the word bounty that uh, it's you know that's that's something that came up for us and and I think there's also a little bit more to do here to reinvent not just how these programs work but you know the the really the words we use to talk about um, some key concepts in infosec so I'll just add this small note and I am fully sated on the topic of bug bounties this I'm good no, I'm kidding. Uh, I think I would share Ryan's interest in the financial plumbing of the platforms, um, particularly given what we've seen in sort of other loosely comparable um, 
I'm going to use the word crowdsourcing. It's not quite right. Read the report to find out more. But those kinds of approaches may not be as sort of scalable, durable, profitable as um, I think some in Silicon Valley have led founders, the public, governments to believe. Uh, and it comes with really, really serious costs for the people who are working in these ecosystems. And I would just like to express gratitude to have been able to work on this topic at the same time um, as these wonderful folks and many others who are sort of pushing the boat out in this space. It's been really, really interesting and um, can't wait to see uh, how folks build upon this and, and, and move forward. Uh, yeah, to add to that, Matt is an extremely humble person, but it's because of Matt that we know each other because he had these conversations with both of us through Dave Society and connected us. And so I just got to give credit where it's due. And Matt, thank you for connecting us and making this happen, um, despite never taking credit for what you do. Well, um, <laughs> that's very flattering, but there's a lot of other people at that in society integral to that. So it's 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 a it's a community, right? Team effort. Yeah. I have one tiny correction as well. I said I early said the Federal Trade Commission, and I realized about 20 minutes ago I meant Federal Communications Commission. So I just wanted to correct that for the record. Nice. The transcript will be appended suitably. I don't know if there's going to be a transcript, but yeah, well, this is great. I mean, thanks everyone for uh, inviting me to participate in this. I learned so much from you all. Thanks to Columbia for hosting this. Uh, Jason, do you have some final thoughts for us? Yeah, absolutely. Hope um, I just learned a ton out of this. This was really fantastic. I, these are topics that I kind of thought I knew something about, and I, I guess I did, but I just learned so much more. So thank you very much. Um, also, um, we've got a ton of other things coming up uh, that we hope that you that have joined here uh, will will like to. Uh, visit also. For example, we have teamed up. Um, our uh, Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies has teamed up with Columbia School of the Arts, uh, the Digital Storytelling Labs for DFRAG, which is the uh, Hacked um, Film Festival. We've got an event on war games that is going to be coming out on the 24th of February. That's going to be featuring, uh, we're pretty sure, um, director of CISA, Jen Easterly, uh, one of the top um, cybersecurity officials in the country, as well as, and I think this is the first time um, for this, we're actually going to have a general from NORAD we hope to have on the panel. So both from the NORAD angle and from that, uh, we have a lot of other uh, events coming up as part of our Nijula Road and Digital Futures Forum. So please keep an eye out for that and also the events coming up from the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. Thank you very much and have a great weekend. But happy Lunar New Year for those that are celebrating.